In 1988, Australia celebrated its bicentenary and Sydney Harbour was the focus for the nation's pride. But as hundreds of thousands of Australians gathered on and around the harbour, a construction group was preparing to take busy cross-harbour traffic beneath the world-famous Blue Waters. The group was a joint venture involving the Australian firm Transfield and Japanese constructors Kumagaigumi. In 1992, after almost five years' work, their vision was reality. The Sydney Harbour Tunnel heads off growing traffic congestion on the Sydney Harbour Bridge, which would otherwise have seen 12 to 13 hour peak periods by the year 2000. Previous crossing studies failed to solve the problems of constructing new approach road networks in residential areas. In 1986, Transfield and Kumagai began developing a proposal to link existing bridge approaches. Traffic capacity in the approaches had grown to 50% more than bridge capacity, creating a major bottleneck. Tunnelling offered a way to link these approaches with minimum environmental impact. Using the immersed tube method meant the tunnel could be shallower, therefore shorter, and connect better with the existing road network. The tunnel links two major road systems serving the bridge to provide a new eastern bypass of the central business district. Twin tunnels carry two lanes of traffic in each direction. North of the harbour, the tunnels run 900 metres through sandstone from the Warringa Freeway to the shoreline. For the water crossing, the tunnels are carried in an immersed tube, buried in a 960 metre long trench across the harbour bed. On the south, the tunnels run 400 metres, again through sandstone, from shoreline to the Carl Expressway. The tunnel is ventilated from Milsons Point on the north shore. The inlet system involves 14 electric fans in a structure under a harbourside park with a ground level air intake. They circulate air through ventilation ducts along both tunnels. Air is drawn back along the roadways to the northern shoreline, then extracted via ceiling openings through a tunnel to the towers of the northern bridge pylon. Banks of eight electric fans in each tower exhaust outlet air through the tops of the towers, almost 90 metres above sea level. The tunnel is a build-operate transfer project constructed by the Transfield Kumagai joint venture for a fixed lump sum price, $560 million. It will be privately operated for 30 years, in which borrowings will be repaid from a government guaranteed income stream designed to be funded by indexed bridge and tunnel tolls. Construction was subject to strict environmental requirements and all work was covered by a comprehensive industrial agreement. The tunnel was constructed for the Road and Traffic Authority of New South Wales and in the year 2022 will be handed over debt-free to the state government. Contract signature was in June 1987 and construction began with the casting basin for the immersed tube units in January 1988. As Sydney Harbour offered no suitable site, an area at Port Kembla, 90 kilometres south, was chosen. The basin was 104 metres wide, 315 metres long, and required 880,000 cubic metres of excavation for a minimum water depth when flooded of 7.5 metres. To stabilise the sides and prevent heave of the base, a dewatering system was installed which included deep wells in the basin and well points on the sides. A recharge system was also installed to protect a major structure nearby. Slag lined the basin slopes with a sand and gravel foundation for the base and sections of no fines concrete to prevent suction under the units when the basin was flooded. The reinforced concrete type of immersed tube unit was chosen for the project. This helped minimise their height, reducing the extent of dredging required, and offered quality control advantages over the steel shell type. To achieve a specified design life of 100 years, concrete for the units had to be impermeable with a low heat of hydration, 
low shrinkage and high chloride and sulphide resistance, as well as achieving the necessary density and strength. The mixture chosen included a blended cement, 60% ground granulated blast furnace slag and 40% type A cement. Blended cement content was 400 kilograms per cubic meter and the water cement ratio was 0.4. Eight units were constructed in two batches of four. Each unit is approximately 120 meters long, 26 meters wide and 7.5 meters high and weighs 23,000 tons. Construction of the first batch of units began in December 1988. Concrete was batched on site using a 100 cubic meter per hour plant. It was pumped up to 450 meters and placed in elements of up to 500 cubic meters. Floors, walls and roofs were formed sequentially in 15 meter bays. Kumagai's textile form system was used to give a dense and hard concrete surface and assist bonding of the waterproof membrane. A PVC membrane was used on the base of the units with a spray-on epoxy tar polyurethane membrane, two millimetres thick, bonded to the walls and roof. In Sydney, work began in February 1988 with excavation for the underground ventilation station in Sandstone at Milsons Point. The first stage of the inlet ventilation station was constructed behind a temporary coffer dam formed by excavated rock and sealed with sheet piles. This structure forms the permanent coffer dam on the north shore. It seals into rock on both sides and at its base, but is otherwise freestanding. An exhaust air tunnel links this structure to the outlet ventilation station in the pylon. The pylon is reinforced concrete with granite cladding. Civil work in the pylon involved demolition of walls and floors, duct construction in reinforced concrete, and installation in the towers of plenum floors, fan floors, and steel ducting. Outside the pylon, the exhaust air tunnel was constructed in cut and cover. Precast concrete beams and planks sealed the gap between the underground inlet structure and rock north and west of it. The ground level inlet was faced with sandstone and the area backfilled and landscaped. Excavation of the northern land tunnels began in August 1988. A 2.8 metre diameter pilot tunnel was driven 750 metres along the route of one of the main tunnels to prove rock conditions. The main tunnels, each 80.5 square metres in cross-section, were excavated primarily by drill and blast, with road headers used at the portals and nearest houses. Rock was removed by barge for disposal in a designated area at sea. The northbound top heading broke through into an excavation in the freeway at North Sydney in March 1990. After benching, an unreinforced concrete lining was placed using a travelling arch form 12 metres long. Travelling formwork heated for early stripping was used for the ceiling panels, which were reinforced and supported by hangers. Concrete was batched on site. The final 150 metres of the northern tunnels were in cut and cover. To minimise the impact on traffic, work was staged, starting with the northbound tunnel exit and finishing with the southbound entrance. For each, almost 400 precast panels were installed to form walls, ceilings and roof. North of these approaches, the tunnel administration and control facility was constructed in the freeway. South of the harbour, work began in October 1988. Driven tunnels were excavated mechanically, primarily by road header, with light support except in low cover areas beneath a historic tree at the southern portal and under the forecourt west of the Opera House. 
reinforced concrete lining was placed and ceiling panels installed using methods similar to those employed on the North Shore. The major challenge on the South Shore was the Southern transition structure. It stands beneath a half metre thick concrete slab forming the Opera House forecourt and a four metre thick tremie concrete seawall. 